Okay, guys, welcome back. Yeah, thank you for asking. I think I'm fine. And today is supposed to be the last day to be stay at home, stuck at home. The plan, unless the mother nature has different plan for Wednesday, the plan Wednesday is going to be in person. But who knows? Maybe there's a heavy snow is going to come somewhere. Maybe the whatever is going to happen, I don't know. Finally, I'm glad the January is done. And hopefully February is going to be have a new chapter. So the plan, hopefully, and Wednesday I'm going to see you, okay? Uh, another thing, by the way, happy Chinese year. Today is the first day. I'm not sure whether today or yesterday. I think you, usually you celebrate guys within one week. I tried to find out the nice image picture, but this is the first one that I found before the class. So anyway, um, let me first go over the uh, class activity, class. Just to make sure that we are on the same page. Uh, maybe a second. Yep, here. Why well, can't see this one here? Okay. Good. So I'll give you the class project, right? So this like uh, sorry, class activity, class activity. Okay. Anyway, I give you like a cyber text, and I ask you to come up with the corresponding plain text do kind of crypto nouns. I give you like hint, okay? So what I expect from you here, I expect from you to follow the crypto nouns form. So in order to give me the to get the full credit, it's not enough just to tell me this is the plain text. No, you have to show me how you get it. And the way how you get that, I think I know you have to use your hand and pencil, paper and pencil in order to answer this one. I think, yeah, when you start uh, French, let me French the symmetric encryption scheme, the one is going to be today, and Wednesday, and Wednesday I'm going to assign the lab to, to you, or the first lab, actually. We're going to see how can you do this one using the lab, I mean using the uh, computer command, or the commands. Okay? So anyway, so right now, I first I wanted to, from you to figure out, to find out, for example, what the frequency of each letter. We talk about the frequency announced, right? You see, for example, how many A's appears here, how many P's, how many C's, and such, how many times this letter appears. Then after that, try to figure out or say, maybe it looks like the highest letter, that high frequent letter called in this cyber text might be E, and the second one might be T. Try to plug this one in the cyber text and see whether it makes sense or not. Okay? So you have to go step by step. In order to count these numbers, yeah, Mono alphabetic, exact. But it's not shifting. Yeah, it's like random, it's like permutation, permutation here. So maybe A is going to be substituted by X, B might be substituted by C. Yeah, but almost one to one. Yeah, exactly, one to one. Sometimes only, I mean, by just looking at the cyber text, you can say, for example, it looks like this one, let's say, this letter. It looks like it's either going to be I or A. You can guess, right? Sometimes. So you can say C it might be A. Yeah, makes sense in this case. And this is going to maybe help you, okay? So first we're going to fill this one, which is going to help you. No, no, not all about the guessing. It is kind of guessing, but it's like scientific guessing. It's not just say, oh, it might be A and B, and you try to elaborate every single possible combination. No. Sometimes, by just looking at the cyber text, you can tell, especially if you have a single letter. You can confirm that by using here the frequency else. When you have the count, I mean, the most, I mean, how many, uh, each for each letter, how many times this letter has been appeared within this uh, cyber text. Then it might be this letter is going to be E. And plug it C, makes sense or not. Yeah, it's like, I prefer to say try and error. Okay? Then after that, check, for example, what's the most frequent double letters, yeah? For example, double S, you check, for example, uh, let me say, <laughs> I didn't find example here. Um, I believe this one, it looks like something ES, maybe, FH, something like this, but you need to double check to see whether it makes sense or not. You see that sometimes if you figure out a few letters, it's going to help you a lot, okay? So see what the, they have a double S. I give you one hint here. We said that the letter never gonna be encrypted by itself. There's no mapping. So if you find, for example, B P W E C, this means 
the third letter is never gonna be E, and the fourth letter, letter so this one in the plain text, never gonna be C. Okay, so you can't tell it's letter. Uh, this word cannot be when. Yeah, so the letter cannot encrypt it as itself. So this eliminate eliminate something. Um. So we have one letter, two letters. Then after that, we're going to start, we have a three letters, uh, I mean, uh, most commonly, frequently letters. For example, we have two letters, and uh, uh, three letters, mainly it's going to T-H-E. If we manage to find something that has T-H-E, now we can figure out the three letters. Then after that, you try to fill these gaps. Then after that, tell me what I mean the, you say, the key here. We say the key, for example, you can tell me at the end, A is going to be mapped to X, for example, to C, for example. B is going to be mapped to whatever. Literally, right? Then here you have to show me, I mean, the plain text. Okay? It depends on you. No, no. Ayala, no, no. You have to hear for the frequency or the whole thing as one unit. Because it's going to help you here. You cannot divide this one into parts, into chunks. No, you have to consider the entire ciphertext in order to count the frequency, right? It's not bad. It's not hard, okay? Uh, it might be annoying at the beginning, yeah, but I mean, it's interesting, okay? Just try to this one. It's one extra credit, by the way. I will give you one point extra. It's going to be one plus extra, okay? And again, when you work with the lab uh, two, or I mean the second lab after we set uh, the, our environment, we're going to see that we're going to use some Linux uh, commands or Kali or whatever commands that we have in order to help us in order to simplify the parcel job. In order to count, I mean, the frequency letter of each other, you can use any software. That's fine. I'm not going to expect from you to use by hand one, two, three, four, five. The counting, the frequency, Either you're gonna write short code, Python or whatever, count uh, the frequency of each letter that help you, or find use whatever word document can help you to count this one. Yeah, I mean, or you can figure out find online resource how can they count the letters. I mean the frequency of each letter. Okay. Anyway. So we're done for this part. This is, I mean, about it. So again, you have to send me this script to form, and you have to meet the side, I mean, the plain text here, in order to get the full credit. Okay. Okay. So today we're gonna talk about the. Uh, I think we're done for that one. Yeah. Yeah. We're gonna talk about the symmetric uh, cryptograph or cryptography. So let me remind you what we did so far. Okay. We went over, we defined, I mean, the cryptology in general, uh, yeah? And we said the cryptology is a science, it's gonna be, it's gonna be defined as a cryptography and a crypto analysis. We define the cryptography as the what? The science, the secret of the science or the art of creating secret, right? And the, we define the crypto analysis as what? The science or the art of breaking the crypto system. In this case, what you try to do here, you try to come up with the way that in order to crack the system, in order to figure out the plain text by just knowing the cyber text without knowing the key. Okay? Then after that, we talk about that different ways. How can we, uh, let's say, classify the cryptography in general, or let's say the encryption scheme or crypto system in general, based on the operation? We, we talk about this one last time. We have two ways. In the way that how we handle or transform the plain text to the cyber text, either can be substitution or transposition, right? Then after that, the second one, we talk about the number of keys used. You can classify the crypto system or cryptography or crypto system into what? Based on the number of keys that you use. Either going to be single key or the more than one key. Then after that, we talk about or define the uh, crypto system as what? Well. As the way we can classify this one into or based on the way that which the plain text is, I mean, uh, the uh, the plain text uh, processing, or how can you process the plain text? We're gonna see starting today, we talk about the uh, modern uh, symmetric cryptography. We're gonna show you that we're gonna talk about the block cyber and the stream cyber. The block cyber, that means in this case, I need to have like the I'm going to perform the operation 
in the blocks of data. So in this case, I require from, from you, or before starting doing encryption or decryption, I expect that we have, for example, a specific number or amount of data. For example, 128 bits or maybe 256 bits. Yeah, in order to process the operation, whether it's going to be encryption or decryption as a unit. For the uh, stream cyber, that means in this case we are going to process the input element continuously. So in this case, I'm just producing the output element one at a time as it goes along. What does that mean in this case? I don't require from you to have you know, I mean, a specific amount of data or the block of data it must be stored as a blocks of data before pass the, the operation. Sorry, we talk about the different types of the uh, um, attacks, right? scenarios. Remember we said we have the bad guy and the bad guy is going to intercept the communication between Alice and Bob, right? So we have here Alice and Bob, when they send something, they're going to send the cyber text. Something is going to be encrypted. And we assume that the attacker maybe knows more than the cyber text. Maybe more, uh, have, or, um, say the attacker knows more information. Okay. So it might be in this case has the, the simple kind of attack. We call this one the cyber text only attack. So the attacker knows only the cyber text. Then, for example, I'm Eve. Okay. I know the cyber text. I'm trying to figure out what's the corresponding plain text without knowing the key. And we know what do we mean by C and M, right? C, that means this is a cipher text. That means how can you get C here? We talk about this one. We're going to be encryption using the key based on this plain text. Usually use the plain text as M or P or whatever. Yeah, it's going to be clear from the context. What do you mean by the value of M or P or whatever? And the, in order to, to get the plain text, or decrypt the message, you're going to use a different operation, or let's say algorithm, which allow you in order to decrypt the cyber text in order to produce a, or reproduce the plain text, right? So the simple kind of attack, we call this one the cyber text, or the attack, the attacker knows only the cyber text, and you try to figure out the key. Uh, sorry, the plain text, without knowing the key. Of course, if you got the key, that's ultimate, the goal for the attacker. If you know the keys that you know to or that are usually used in order to communicate, that's gonna be perfect because I'm gonna all the information that they change using that key is gonna be readable by you, right? The second kind of attack we call the known plain text attack. So the attacker knows more information. We don't assume that the attacker only has a cyber text. No. At my the attacker has what? More information has, for example, the cyber text that tried to figure out the corresponding khaki plus have a sequence of plain text cyber text pairs. So you do have, for example, M1 and corresponding C1. Let's say up to MN and corresponding CN. So you have a set of sequence of plain text cyber text. Okay? And based on this information here, the attacker tried to figure out, break down the C. Maybe someone said, how the attacker knows this information? The attacker maybe will be legit user, okay? And the attacker maybe monitor the communication from long time. So the attacker can tell exactly what's going on. Okay? The other type of attack here. Okay. I know I see something red in my screen, but I, you hear me, right? Everything is clear, right? I mean, my voice. I know it's annoying a little bit, but you're still being able to, yeah. Okay, great. Because I saw here there is the red sign here, so I need to just to make sure that what's going on. Anyway, the other kind of attack now is chosen plain text attack. Oh, that's not known a plain text attack. There's something like advanced here. So in this case, the attacker is gonna know what in this case. It's gonna know, I mean, the uh, a set of let's say uh, it's gonna have the C, the cipher text, and also the attacker knows the message M1 and M2 before getting the C and get the decryption. So in this case, for the attacker, I'm gonna choose what kind of attack. For the non plain text attack, I didn't get a chance to choose with the, I mean, the sequence of the plain text cyber text prayers. Now I just monitor the system and figure out what's the plain text, I mean, M1, the message, and this is the corresponding cyber text M1. M2, the plain text, and the corresponding message are the cyber text of M2, okay? Here, for the chooser, the plain text attack, and to choose a cyber text attack, the attacker has a chance to choose the message or the cyber text. Yeah, so in this case, I can use, for example, M1 
up to mn, send it to the server, the server encrypt them, then I know the corresponding value C1 up to Cn. So I get a chance to choose what the plain text. For the chosen cybertext attack, the attacker has a different case. It's the same thing, but the attacker can choose from C1 up to Cn, send it to the server, the server can decrypt them, so I can get M1 up to Mn. The question here, how the attacker can do that? The attacker, as we mentioned last time, might be, let's say, a legit user. Normal user can use the system, and the user can, for example, generate a message, yeah, and ask the server in order to encrypt them or decrypt them, right? But as a user, you are not allowed to see the other people's messages. That's the difference. So since the server is going to use, for example, the same key in order to encrypt all the exchange of messages, encryption, decryption, so the attacker gets kind of, of I mean, get access to this kind of information. Make sense? The other kind of attack is going to be max chosen, I mean, plain text, trans, uh, cyber text attack. So not all the sequence of uh, plain text, cyber text pairs is going to be either going to be chose, uh, plain text or chosen, I mean, cyber text. going to be max. For example, from C1 up to Cn divided by 2, this is, I choose as a tracker, this is the half of the message, I'm going to choose the cyber text. Then, from, say, Mn divided by 2 plus 1 up to Mn, the other part is going to be the plain text. So, half, half. Why I need to perform this one? Because I need to monitor the behavior of the, the uh, I mean, with the, how the, the server is going to behave in this case. For example, as what we did in the adaptive uh, chosen plain text attack. For the attacker, I'm going to use what? I'm going to use choose M1, send it to the server, the server is going to give me C1. By just comparing, looking at the value of M1 and C1, I say, okay, if I give M1 message has this value, this is the result. What if I change one letter in this message? So I'm going to create message M2 by maybe minor modification to the message M1. Maybe add white spaces, maybe add uppercase, the button lowercase for the one letter. Send it to the server, and the server supply with C2, and see whether there is any correlation, any connection, whether modify this letter, how many letters are going to be affected, or the, I mean, whether it's going to be affected by uh, cyber text. And it's it, okay? And here you can do this one, whether it's going to be for the message, it's going to be adaptive, chosen plain text attack, or it's going to be uh, with the cyber attacks, it's going to be adaptive, it shows the cyber text attack. For the adaptive, adaptive again, so in this case, uh, the bad guy is going to choose the text one at a time. It's not going to be as a chunk. For the chosen cyber text attack, a chosen, I mean, plain text attack, in this case, you get to choose, as a, uh, you have N message, either going to be from M1 up to MN, or you have a C1 up to CN, right? Or the max it half half, but you are you once you do this one, you send it as one block and get the result. It's not one at a time. I'm not gonna send it one message at a time. Then after that, once you receive the corresponding cyber text, I can modify a new message then send it. Yeah. So the adaptive is very strong kind of attack. Okay. And we mentioned one interesting thing. Then after that, you need to jump to the symmetric, the most important thing. We talk about the Kirchhoff uh, uh, principle. Does mean the security for any system must be based on what? Based on the secrecy of the key, not based on the encryption scheme. Then we talk about, of course, I mean, different uh, symbol, substitution, transposition, uh, crypto system. Okay? So today we're going to talk about, I mean, the symmetric crypto, cryptography. So first, when you talk about this one, I'm going to revisit or talk about some components. The first one. I'm going to define the threat model. Usually, what do you mean by the threat model? We have some assumptions. What the bad guy can do. What the bad guy can access. What the bad guy can, uh, or what kind of computation power the bad guy can have. Okay? Then after that, we talk about the symmetric encryption principle. We're going to talk about a few principles. Then after that, we're going to give you two examples about this, I mean, modern symmetric encryption scheme. The one, the first one is called data encryption standard, the DS. And the second one is the advanced encryption standard, which the AES is still used up to date. In the lab, you are going to test all of them. I'm going to explain to you what I expect from you to know here. I'm not going to, I mean, require from you to memorize, but I want to see or show you that how this crypto system works. Okay? Then I'm going to build or specify, for example, say, 
this slide is very important. That's what I expect to you. What kind of question that you expect from this one? Of course, I'm not going to say explain how the DS works. It takes for you hours just to write this one. Yeah, but I want from you to understand the mechanism. And we're going to revisit the confusion diffusion. We're going to see what the relation between confusion diffusion and how can we get this one to this property or achieve this one using these kind of encryptions. Then after that, we're going to talk about the uh, cyber block modes, modes of operation. What does that mean in this case? We can explain. Generally speaking, you have, for example, large file, right? And when you try to use, for example, block ciphers here, system, the required to have the data must be divided into blocks. And the size of blocks must have a specific value, okay, length. Yeah, what if the file exceeds this length? So you're going to see how to handle this one. What if the file is less than the size of the required block, in the, I mean, the size of the block required in order to perform this kind of, or use this crypto system? How can we handle this one? That's the meaning here. And you are going to test this one in the lab, and the lab is going to be interesting if you understand how to the theoretical part. So the lab just to try to apply this one with a small few commands, <coughs> sorry, in order to help you to make sure that we understand the routine. Then after that, the most important thing here, when you talk about the encryption scheme, we said Alice and Bob wanted to communicate securely. We assume that Alice and Bob already have the key, right? Now you need to lock it. So how are they going to exchange the key in the first place? This is going to be one problem. We're going to touch this one in this lecture. I mean, in this chapter. Later, we talk about the asymmetrical public key encryption scheme. We're going to see how can we achieve using the public key encryption scheme can do, perform what is called the key distribution. Okay. So as I mentioned, the third model we're going to take a look what the, the adversary or the bad guy know, access, and do. Okay, so we're going to take a look for more details here. The first thing with this assumption, the bad guy, we said the bad guy knows the algorithm used, right? When you work with any, uh, I mean, you, you exchange the data, you're going to say, hey, I'm using, for example, whatever encryption scheme or crypto system. Everyone knows that. The certificate, when you, have, when you exchange your certificate in order to try to authenticate your public key, we're going to see this one. Yeah, if you take a look in your browser, you're going to have a bad lock in the left, in the top of the browser in the left. You click over this one, you're going to see the certificate, right? We're going to say we are going to use a specific encryption scheme in order to compute the hash function. Does anyone knows that? Yeah? So the problem, but when you sign this message or when you send this message, I'm going to hide the key. The key is not going to be available. It's not going to public information. The reason behind this one, maybe you say, maybe someone can say, ah, what if, or in other words, can we use them in crypto system uh, or, or try to make sure the, or use secure crypto system? The problem with the crypto system, if you said, okay, I'm gonna ignore whatever Kirchhoff principle came up with, with the 19th century, I think, yeah, 1883. Before that time, people used the, I mean, secure encryption scheme. Okay, you don't know what the crypto system The problem with this one, maybe you're gonna use a system that you thought it's secure while everyone outside knows what uh, about this secure system. And there's something, it's hard to keep something secure. And also it's hard to prove it whether it works or not. Maybe it's secure, but it's bad, it's weak system. So anyone wants to see the message, say, oh, it's easy, I can get the cyber text. And you, went, and you thought that's secure. And the problem if you use expensive things like as an algorithm, it's not easy to substitute or come up with another encryption scheme, right? And that one's gonna be secure. In other words, uh, you have, for example, a secret uh, uh, encryption methods, yeah? Make it secure. It's hot in order to change this one. Or it's gonna be expensive because you need to come up with a new encryption scheme or new method in order to do this one. So Kirchhoff said, okay, the new thing, the system is going to be what? It's going to be open design. The only thing, the security must be based on what? Based on the key. There's like a piece of information. It's easy to change. Yeah. But this one's going to help you in order to secure this. Make sense? Okay. So we're still in the third model. So we said, okay, the, the attacker or the bad guy knows, I mean, the algorithm that I'm going to use. 
And also, what's the behavior, for example? They know, for example, uh, we communicate using a specific language. That's one thing. They know, for example, what the common sentence or letters or paraphrases. For example, when you exchange a message, say, for example, usually when I send email, the first letter or the first line, there'll be dear, for example, hello or hi or dear student, right? Whatever. And the end, best, for example, and my name, right? Something like this. So, you know, oh, they use specific phrases at the beginning, at the end. So this information can help for the attacker. It might help them and might be known to the attacker. Okay, and also maybe like uh, we have some best phrases or likely keys that might the user can use. I know, for example, the user, the name, the birthday, the pet, the girlfriend name, boyfriend name, whatever this kind of information that we expect that the user maybe uses them as a password or as a key, and etc. We get uh, to, uh, later in this class. We're gonna talk about the password here, and you're gonna be amazed that what's the top, do you know what's the number one password in the United States? Actually, one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, five, six. You're gonna see this one. Based, I mean, million of leaked records. It's not. I mean, it depends on the leaked information. Leaked information. That means those are weak uh, passwords. Exactly. It's something one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I don't remember six, seven, eight. It depends. Okay. Every year they have maybe this number goes up or down because I mean, uh, I mean, you see that people or oh, sometimes people use password. Yeah. Password, the same password, or uh, password, then you use just without, uh, instead of using S, we're going to use, for example, O. Or without, uh, instead of using O, they're going to use o zero, for example, something like this, or dollar sign, actually, without this. Anyway, people tend to use a weak password. And once you collect them, yeah, yes, some people. That's why we're going to talk about this one later when we talk about the password. But it's interesting to know that. Knowing this information might be help you in order to figure out what's the password or best phrase that you use in order or the best key that you use in order to encrypt or store or access or gain access to the system. Good. The second part of the adversary model here, or what the uh, third model, what the bad guy acts to what? What kind of information? We said right now, we assume that the attacker can do whatever in the system. Can intercept the communication? Can create, modify, or come up with a new message. Okay, so based on this one, we need to think we, by knowing what the attacker knows, okay, what the attacker can do, okay, what the attacker, for example, acts, has acts to, then after that, we need to think about the way how can you model the crypto system in general, based on, uh, in order to, for example, to achieve confidential communication, why there's someone that can uh, be being able to intercept the communication? Why someone can be able in order to, to say modify or inject in your message? Okay. Okay. So we're gonna talk about the modern cryptography as a mission. Today we're gonna start looking at the symmetric cryptography. Then next week we're gonna talk about the public key. Okay. On the next lecture, kind of. I'm not sure. It depends. And they say next we're going to talk about the uh, the public key. Anyway, when you talk about the symmetric encryption here, that means we're going to use only one key. The same key used for the encryption, the same key used at the decryption step. Okay? And sometimes you call this one the conventional encryption. Sometimes you call secret key, single key encryption. All of them are names of the symmetric. Okay? It used to be the only option before the public key, before 1970. Yeah, if you're born at that time, that means you are old. I'm old, right? But thanks God, I didn't. I wasn't born at that time. So anyway, still most widely used alternative because the interesting thing or the attractive property of the symmetric encryption scheme, it's fast. It's e I mean, it's so fast in order to encrypt the messages and etc. We do have a two requirements in order for secure use for the symmetric encryption. We need to have a strong encryption algorithm. What does that mean? It's not secure, but strong. It's not simple one. Say, for example, you take the message, uh, whatever the message, PM, add the key, add mod, for example, for example, mod 26. That's easier. It's not strong. 
right? And also the sender and the receiver must have what? Get access to the key. Must be having. How? We don't know yet. Later we're gonna figure out. Right now we assume, yeah, we do have the key. Good. And the key must be kept secret. Otherwise the system is gonna be collapsed. We do have what? The plain text, the original message. We do have an um, ingredient to work with this one. The uh, cipher text, the, the message, encrypted message. We have encryption algorithm and decryption algorithm. Somehow these guys are going to be trying to reverse the operation. Okay? And of course we have, I mean, the key. We call this one the secret key. Okay? Let's take a look at symbol uh, algorithm. Just I mean to uh, simulate and see how they exchange the message in secure environment or secure channel. So here, for example, when you have the message, I'm playing text, I'm going to use X. Yeah, you're going to hate me. Sometimes use X, sometimes use P, sometimes use M. I know, I need to make sure that every semester said I need to update the slides to make sure that I gotta use only one plain, uh, one letter for the plain text, but it never happened. Anyway, so assume that you take the message X, okay? You need to encrypt it using the key. You see, the key here must be somehow shared before you perform the encryption. Here we're gonna take the message. I mean, this is how can we represent uh, the encryption, you take the message X, and you're going to produce C, or here in this case we produce Y. When you send this one to the other side, the other side is going to reverse the operation, the encryption, using the same key for the message of the cyber text, and this one hopefully going to produce, I mean, the the message. You see that I'm figuring out, trying to figure out what's the plain text, the letter that you use for the plain text. Okay? This is the symbol I, I got. Good. We do have, I mean, two types of the encryption, symmetric encryption. We have a stream cyber, and we have what's called, I mean, the block cyber. What is the stream cyber? The stream cyber, remember the one time bad? We talked about this one last lecture. Yeah. The one time bad here, allow me to perform what? It looks like you have the message. Yeah. See that here. So I'm going to try to use the same ones. We have the message P, exclusive of all with the key, right? Something like this. Right, we have a mod, whatever, true example. Then, after that, in order to reverse the operation here, this is going to be C. You have to take the C, exclusive all with the key, mod, whatever. Then you're going to have the message B. Right, and you said the size of the key must equal to the or similar or same as the size of what the size of plain text. It's hot, it's secure, one time pad, use the key only once. Never use use the key, but the problem: How can you come up with a key that be larger or similar to the size of the message? What if you have the message one megabyte or one gigabyte? I mean, fine, large file. Right? So in this case, it's hard, right? So in this case, we're gonna modify a little bit in the stream side of the symmetric encryption scheme. We're gonna oh, extend the idea for one time pad. Here we're gonna use the key, but the key is not gonna be used directly in order to encrypt the message. No, we are going to use the key in order to produce the cryptographic. I mean, uh, say cryptographic. I mean, sorry, the bit stream. Okay, so it looks like in this case here we come up with a key stream with a sequence of pseudo random numbers, digits. Okay, which is gonna be, uh, I mean, extend to the length of the plain text. In order to what? In order to uniquely encrypt every single character based on the corresponding digit of the key string. Let's do this one. For example, I have the message has, for example, 1000 bits. The key, for example, 128 bits. I plug this one in a special algorithm, and this one is gonna keep producing zeros and one, and the size is gonna be 1000 bits. The same algorithm here, okay? When, when for every single bit here, it's gonna be, let's say, XORed with what? Every single corresponding bit in the message and produce a cipher text. So that's why in this case we're going to use the same thing. Actually, we did this one. So I'm going to use PI, <coughs> sorry, exclusive with KI. I'm going to use a small KI. Okay. And the value of KI is not the key itself. It's like a pseudo random, let's say, digit generated by this key. Make sense? So in this case, if the key, I'm gonna, I can use the key 128, 20 bits, for example. And so the key used as a seed. And this algorithm not to produce pseudo-random numbers. 
Okay, and the size I can't specify how many CD random numbers gonna be the length it can be produced. But then after that, I'm gonna use this one in order to encrypt the message, the input message, one at a time. I mean, I mean, uh, character by character, uh, byte by byte, pit by pit. It depends. Okay, in order to reverse the operation, I'm gonna use the same key and use the same algorithm in order to produce the same key stream. All right. Then I use this one in order to decrypt the message. Whatever the cipher text here, I'm gonna manage to get the original message. Make sense? That the stream cipher. Okay. I'm ready to fight. Make sense. Okay, good. Um, let me have a quick example here. For example, to go back here just to have something easy. Okay, assume the message, for example, the P here. Just a quick example here to see the value of P is equal one zero one one zero one 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 zero whatever. Okay, something like this. I see we have, for example, 1,000 bits. This is the bit number one, this is number two, this is the bit number 1,000, okay? I have the key, for example, 1010, four bits, for example. In order to perform the one-time path, I cannot do this one. The size of the key must be 1,000 bits. That makes sense. Here, for the same size of the model here, I need to do something different. I'm not going to use, use the same uh, the idea for the one-time path, but I'm going to do this one differently. I'm gonna take the key, one zero one zero. I do have an algorithm. I mean, this can use a shift register or left right shift register, whatever, in order to generate a random number. This one just have a seed, few bits as input, and keep it producing a sequence of random zeros and ones. It's not actually one hundred percent hand because after a few, I mean, number of iteration, it's gonna do what reproduce the same. I mean, bits, right? The only way, by the way, to produce random numbers is do what? Flip the coins. Physically. One at a time. That the that the random. And the rest is not random, it's gonna be pseudo-random. After that, number of iteration, I'm gonna reproduce the same thing. Anyway, this one is gonna keep what? It's gonna produce you say 1000 bits. Okay? Then you take the first bit here and exclusive all with the first bit here, produce the corresponding cyber text. Take the second bit with the second, x all, reduce the second bit, and etc. In order to decrypt this one, you can have a sequence of cipher text. You have the same key, you have the same algorithm, which is gonna produce the exact 1000 bits, okay? Then you're gonna reverse the separation order to produce the message, okay? Make sense? That's the cipher. I mean, the same cipher. Good. The other one you talk about here, the block cipher. I wanted to focus on the block cipher. The block cipher is like the most common type of the symmetric cipher. Most of the symmetric cipher, a modern one is gonna be what? Block cipher. What does that mean in this case? For the block cipher here, we are going to spend, or assume that, you have a data, right? I need to divide, for example, this is the file that you wanted to encrypt. Okay. The size of the file, for example, one th say thousand kilobytes. For example, just an example, okay. And the algorithm that I use it require for me what the data as input in order to perform the encryption or decryption. You must provide me with like a block with the specific length. Assume when you say the specific length is gonna be hundred bit bytes, just to simplify the process. Let me go, by the way, 1,000 bytes, just to simplify the ones. Assume that Gotham Archiving has 100 bytes. So I divide my data into 10 blocks, each 100 bytes. I take this block as input, perform encryption. As a block, using the key, I can produce, I mean, corresponding cyber text. Okay? If the size of the file is larger than the size of the blocks, they produce number of blocks, now we need to think a way, how can we handle these blocks? 
with I'm gonna encrypt each uh, each of them individually. Then after that, concatenate them as a result. Or somehow we have a maybe smart way in order to perform this one. That we're gonna be covered as a mode of operation later. Okay. The other thing we think about: what if the size of the block or the data that you have is less than hundred bytes? So what you need to do here? You need to fill this one with some data. You have to make sure that at least you have one block. Make sense? For the same cyber, I don't care. Whatever you have, data, you have zero, one, one byte, one character, give it to me, I'm gonna produce a result. I can work with, say, any number of data. Here, no. Here you have to provide me with the blocks of data, and the size of the blocks, it depends what kind of algorithm or crypto system that we're gonna use. So here you take a lock here. When you work with a block cyber, you give me, for example, a specific block. The input has, for example, size, length, I'm going to perform encryption, okay? I didn't see what the actual encryption algorithm is going to do here, but we still we simulate that. Okay, we have a message. The size of the message is one block, and I'm going to use the key. Now I'm going to produce the cyber text. The size of the cyber text is going to be equal to exact the size of the plain text. For example, if the plain text is 100 bytes, the cyber text is going to produce 100 bytes. But I'm still not accurate when you say 100 bytes. It depends whatever algorithm that we have. Yeah, it depends on the crypto system. Each of them have some requirement. But with block cyber, I'm going to tell you what the size of the block in order to perform operation. It can allow you in order to perform, let's say, encryption or decryption. Okay? So here, for example, if we have... Uh... No, no, no. It depends on the algorithm. We're going to see that when you talk about the DS, for example, what's the size of the message is given. Remember, the size of the block here. So that means in order to perform the encryption, you have to make sure when you write your software that you have to divide the data into blocks. And each block must have a specific number of bits. Then you fed this one to the encryption function in order to perform the encryption and then produce a result. If you have more than one block, I mean, the data can be divided into more than one block, so the most of the time that we have. So in this case, you need to hear and figure out the way how can you gonna apply the encryption based on this block. You're gonna do this one separately. Each of them is gonna be uh, encrypted by itself. Then after that, you can continue the corresponding cyber text, or you have to figure out a way how to connect them. That's a different story. The size of the block here is gonna be, for example, in our case, it's gonna be P, okay? Pits, for example, the size of the key, for example, k. That means here how many number of keys are available. It can be to the power k. Yeah. For example, assume k number of bits two. Of course, it's not two, but just to simplify the process. The total number of keys can be used to the power two to equal four. Right? Why is four? That's me because you have two bits. Either it can be zero zero, or zero one one zero one one. All the possible keys here. Usually, when you work with the encryption, it's going to be, for example, 128 bits. Oh, 2 to the 128 bits. So, all the first bits are going to be all going to be zeros, up to all of them is going to be 1. Those are the key space that you can choose from. Okay? Good. Uh, typical block size is going to be 64 to 128 bits. Okay? But very, it depends on the algorithm that we can use. Good. So, we talk about the diffusion computer, right? And here we will try to look at what? How can we build the block cyber in general? So, remember the principle of the uh, diff confusion, uh, diffusion? Let's remind you with this one. What's the confusion here? The confusion is defined as what? A technique, a way that ensures that the cyber text gives no clue about the plain text. So in other words, if you have the cyber text, by just looking at the cyber text, you cannot come up with any information about the plain text without knowing the key. Okay? So in other words, in this case, the relationship between the cyber text and the key is going to be what here? It's going to be hidden. Okay? So let me take a look here. Uh, uh, first of all, how can we do this one? We can achieve the confusion by doing what? Substitution. You can use substitution in order to do what? 
by just looking to the ciphertext, you cannot tell anything about the plain text. Of course, it depends on the algorithm that we have, yeah. Yeah, this simple substitution is easy, but this is the way, how can you perform that? Okay? The second one is diffusion. Diffusion in this case, I'm trying to what? The idea here to try to hide, to say, the relationship between what? Between, I mean, the cyber text and the plain text. What does that mean in this case? If we don't have a diffusion, this is an interesting example. If you don't have a diffusion, if you change, for example, one bit, let's say, assume that the cyber text something like this, 1011. This is the cyber text. The uh, encryption using the key, and this is going to be the plain text. Okay, uh, sorry, the, this is the sorry, plain text, and this is the cyber text. If we didn't have a diffusion, if you change one letter here, from assume that it's going to be produced 1000. If I change this one, one letter, 1010, one zero, one zero, if this one only change or produce only change in one letter, so I can't tell, oh, there is a connection between the cyber text and plain text. I can't find the pattern. In other words, if you don't have a diffusion, you modify one specific letter, you can figure out the exact letter that has been changed or which the location that has been changed at the cyber text. It looks like one to one. So that's bad. But since we have a diffusion, if you change one letter in the plain text, this is gonna be affect at least, let's say, have the letter or the bits at the cyber text. Uh, can you hear me, guys? How about now? Okay, I will do this one again, okay? I will reconnect. Let me give me a second. How about now, guys? You still being able to hear me or still choppy? Okay. My kids is not here, but it looks like my wife may be playing games downstairs. My kids is not here. No one grinding. But um, I will double check. Maybe definitely my wife did that. <laughs> anyway. So... Let's back to this one. So that's means the diffusion here. This guy what? It's give me if you have a diffusion, you're gonna hide the relationship between the cyber text and plain text. If you change one text or one character or one to say bit and the plain text, this one is gonna be affect at maybe at least the half of the to say uh, bits at the cyber text. So you cannot tell. This, oh, it's easy. Modify this one. Ah, oh, it's gonna be change this one. So you're gonna find out the relationship. No. So the confusion and diffusion gonna be very important uh, property that help us in order to build the block cyber. Okay? So let's be here, back to slides here. Good, let me jump to slide 12, just need to make sure that where am I. So the first principle that I'm looking for, or two main principle, the confusion diffusion. Good. Can you use this one by itself or not? No. For example, if someone is gonna say, is it enough to have system just provide me with the confusion? Or crypto system that can provide me or have, you say, the diffusion properties? No. We need to have both of them in the system. Okay? Good. When you combine the diffusion diffusion together, or to have, let's say, in my system, when you perform encryption, encryption decryption, I'm going to perform substitution and transposition, we call this system product system. Okay? So the product cipher or the product system is defined as what? As the following here. That's in this case, I'm gonna combine the diffusion 
diffusion uh, confusion together in one crypto system in order to build stronger uh, block size. Okay. So this is the idea is called the product cycle. So you see that you have, for example, diffusion, confusion. Then after that, I'm going to repeat this one for multiple times. Okay. You combine this one and you're going to perform this one, for example, multiple rounds. It's not only one time, many rounds. You see, combine them and perform this one many rounds. You're going to perform, you see that the diffusion one and the confusion uh, here, diffusion one is the exact algorithm of the, yeah. I go through the diffusion two and three and four. But the input gonna be different. We're gonna use X, for example, then after that we're gonna use what whatever the result in the next step. This is the round here. This is I mean what I've said in order to perform this one multiple times, you're gonna have a better diffusion and confusion. Okay, especially for the diffusion here. If you take a look here, that's what I said. The example, remember I say the relationship between the cyber text and the plain text can be hidden. So you see that, assume that we have original message here, yeah? Then you, once you send this one, or say, this is my message, after before the block cipher, this is the result. What if someone can say, okay, I'm gonna flip only one bit here, this bit, and see whether the output comes there be. You see the output, how many bits, Most, at least the half of the bits has been changed. So now you cannot tell, so, oh, if you modify this one, it's gonna affect only one place. So you cannot, <coughs> sorry, you cannot, I mean, track the system, yeah? You cannot break the system because it's hard to figure out. Remember, he's only six or eight bits. What if we have a uh, large message? Okay, thousands of bits. What? Yeah, so you see that. Or let's say uh, 128 bits. It's hard to figure out for every single bit. We're having a, maybe half of the bit at least going to be changed. So we cannot find this one. How can you achieve, achieve this? I mean, good diffusion, confusion, after you perform diffusion, confusion for multiple rounds, for many rounds. Okay? One another property we need to take a look here, or we'll study or we'll look at, the composition. You note something here, right? Whatever the input here, it's going to be output. And the output is going to be input again here. Okay? So in the, the uh, compos composition or crypto system here, we're going to do the same. Uh, let me give you a quick example here. Assume that we have the block one. Let's say one algorithm here. I'm going to use encryption. And this one, I'm going to use K1. OK? Then you have encryption and K2. Maybe inside encryption here, I'm going to perform diffusion, diff uh, uh, diffusion and confusion diffusion inside this one. So it's going to be the same algorithm. The only difference, the input going to be changed. I'm going to use two different keys. Okay? I'm going to input, I try to use the same as, I use K prime and K double prime. Here, I'm going to use, I mean, uh, sorry, K1 and K2. I have the message M, and after I perform the encryption use the K1, I'm going to produce the, say, uh, C1. Yeah? Then the C1 is going to be input to the second algorithm, then I'm going to produce, for example, the message C, okay, or the, the cipher text. So if you take a look here, the C is equal to what? I'm going to encrypt the message M using the K1, right? Then after that, I'm going to encrypt whatever I have using the K2, right? That's what we did. In order to reverse this operation, this is the composite cipher, the outcome of one encryption, one, let's say one round, I'm going to be to fit as an input to another round. But we're going to use different keys. Okay? When you try to reverse the operation, we have with C, you're going to go back to the M. How can you do that? First, the higher level on the top, the last operation you perform, you encryption using K2. In order to move this operation, you start, it looks like M here, I need to go back. In order to get back to the C1, I need to reverse this operation. How can you reverse this operation? I'm going to take the C, okay, and decrypt using the K2. This is going to produce C1, right? Then after that, I'm here. I need to reverse the operation. I need to decrypt whatever C1 using the key one in order to produce M, right? So in order to start from C to go back to the M, I'm going to say C is going to be decrypt using... We start here, decrypt using the KT2 for the C. Then after that, I'm going to decrypt this one using the K1. 
in order to produce the message M. All right, this is the way how can we reverse the operation from C to the M. Make sense? If we have another layer or another encryption, another, we're gonna perform this one operation again. So C is gonna be able to another encryption. I mean, uh, another round. And the only difference here, I need just to use different keys and etc. And there is in order to use different keys in order to perform it and have a secure algorithm. We're gonna talk about this one later. Make sense so far? The structure, I mean, the building component that we're gonna use in order to build our system. Okay. The other thing, as you mentioned here, I cannot use the same key. If you have, for example, 16 rounds, okay, can you use 16 keys? Yes, but how can we generate or exchange 16 keys? It's too hard. So we modify this one in order to, uh, instead of use, I mean, 16 fresh key, maybe we're gonna use only one key. We treat this one as a master key, with the key is gonna be exchanged right now. When you try, Alice and Bob try to communicate together, they're gonna share the key K as a master key, okay? Then when you try to perform the encryption, you see that, for example, I need to perform this one 60 rounds. You remember, you understand what you mean by the rounds, right? You're gonna be confusion, diffusion. Then after that, the output is gonna be input to the second round of the diffusion, confusion, and etc. 16 times. And each round, you're gonna use a key. I'm going to use what? I'm gonna use a sub key. So I'm gonna come up with one algorithm. This algorithm is gonna generate the sub keys. So this one gonna have the value of only master key for the special algorithm, and this one gonna generate keys from K1 up to K16. We call this one sub keys. Make sense? Which simplify the process. I have one key, master key. I use this one in order to generate sub keys. So there's no, it depends whatever algorithm that we have. 16 rounds, 14 rounds, 10 rounds. By the way, it depends on the algorithm that I'm gonna use, okay? In the DS, it's gonna be six rounds. Because for every single operation or the same round, we need to have a come up with a key, different keys, right? If we're gonna perform, let me go back here. Assume this is one round, yeah? And the algorithm required from you to have for every single round here, you need to use key. I need to use key one, and this is I need to use different keys. Here I need K and keys. Can you exchange K and keys? Not too much. So though it's unpractical, yeah? Unpractical to do that. So the goal is come up with one key, K, and the key is gonna be somehow plugged in an algorithm. We're gonna see what kind of algorithm which is gonna allow me in order to produce K1 up to Kn keys. I can use every single keys for a round to simplify the process. Make sense? Okay. Um, another thing here. How can we imply the cipher on the sequence of blocks? Remember, what if we said the block required we have the pipette in order to what? In order to perform encryption decryption, right? And this one gonna be for sixteen rounds or whatever. Okay. What if my data can be divided in more than one block? So it looks like you have block one block 2 up to block X or let's say uh, M, M a block. So okay, the simple thing in order to, so when you divide your data into M blocks, for every single block you're going to perform whatever encryption algorithm, but use the corresponding cyber text, right? For each of them, right? So in this case, I'm going to do what? I divide my data into blocks and for each block it's going to be encrypted separately. <clears throat> okay, that one way. This is not secure. Then after that, this, you can concatenate all the cyber text, send it as one unit. This is not secure. We're gonna see this one later. There's a many ways, different ways to perform that. More efficient, secure way. For example, once you produce the first cyber text of the first block, use it in order to help you in order to encrypt the second cyber text. I mean, second block. Once you produce that, the cyber text of second block, use the output in order to produce, will help you to uh, encrypt the third block, and so on. So there's different ways how can we handle that. Just keep this one in your mind later at the end of this chapter when it's done, we're gonna talk about this one in more details. But there's way, how can you handle this? The first algorithm, by the way, the structure that's gonna help us in order to understand, I mean, the, uh, 
or the building block that mainly used for many um, block cyber, symmetric block cyber, is called FISTO, cyber or network. Okay. When you talk about this one, by the way, this is not an algorithm. It's not a specific crypto system or block cyber. This is just, I mean, design model. They used in order to help them to build, the, for example, the block cybers. Okay, it looks like the blueprint, like template. Yeah, then this is the structure. Then when you build, for example, the especially if you're the early block cybers, most of them based on this algorithm or this structure action. Okay, so in this case, at least no need to tell who's come up with this one. Uh, when they built this one, I mean, when he came up with uh, this algorithm or this structure. But this is an interesting thing here, yeah? as a mission can be used for many uh, block cyber algorithms. Okay, I update the slides and then remove this one. It looks like I'm using the old one here. Anyway, it's going to be used as a, many block cybers. Okay, they use the same structure DS, the one that we're going to cover today, and RC, etc., but not an AS with advanced encryption. So I understand it. Let's take a look at this how it looks like. If we understand the structure of this scheme, or the design model is going to help us to understand, I mean, the most of the block cyber algorithm. This one is going to have a simple thing, okay? Let me get jump to this one here. This is, I mean, the structure in general. They said you have, you see that, we divide this one into many rounds. Remember, we understand what you mean by the rounds, right? We try to perform substitution, diffusion, I'm sorry, uh, substitu uh, diffusion confusion in each round. Okay, for each round, you're going to use a specific key as a sub key, right? And inside this round, you're going to see what's going on. We're going to take a lock here, okay? So you start with the original message, then you end up we have the corresponding cyber message. The first thing, this algorithm is going to do what? You take the input block, okay? And this, by the way, and we, this is the encryption. So again, so just to summarize this one, the encryption process uses this structure. It's going to consist of what? Multiple rounds of the processing of what the plain text. Each round consists of substituting and it's going to be permutation. Yeah, when you talk about permutation, substitution, then I'm talking about the confusion diffusion. And you beat this one multiple times in order to achieve this, uh, the, uh, I mean, our goal and the security goal. Number of rounds, it depends. This is the structure, and then this is the way how to achieve better confusion diffusion. And it depends on the algorithm that we actual algorithm we can specify how many rounds you're going to perform. I'm going to talk about this one more details with the DS. Okay, so first, let's understand how it works. You take the plain text, this is the plain text. Okay, you assume that two W bits. Okay, you divide this one into two half equal left and right. We call this one the left and the right, okay? And each of them, in this case, W bits, okay? Good. Then after that, the right one or the right half of the block is going to be what? Any change. You see, the right one going to be passed, go through without any change. Whatever you have in the right one, I'm talking about the round one, okay? In the round one, we usually going to use L0 and L1 as input with the initial value, okay? The R0 is going to be passed, go through. Because without any change, good. Why we gonna see that? Remember, you, when you come up with algorithm, we need to find a way. How can we invert this one? So let me explain how it works. Then after that, we see why this is the case. How, why it works? Then the left one is gonna be what here? It's gonna be fit into the specific function. Okay. First, before this one, gonna be x or with what? With the function f. And the function f takes two inputs. Take the r0, and it's going to be the key one with the key used for the first round. You see the key one, specific function, I don't know, whatever the function f. Then after that, going to be xo with the left half date. Then this one going to produce the resulting. Now, then after that, you exchange. Whatever you have on the right side, take a copy, put it in the left side. And whatever produced in the left side, put it in the right side. So in this case, whatever the operation here, put this one here, and the R0 is going to be here. So I produce L1 and R1, which is going to be the value for the next round. Okay? Make sense? Then after that, you're going to perform this one for the second round. The only difference is the input values and also the keys. 
but it's gonna be the exact structure. Then at the end, you're gonna perform the last permutation, or last, uh, I mean to say, uh, change the value, exchange the values. Yeah, then after that, you're gonna produce the final result. Let me first explain what's going on here. When you talk about this part, if we go back here, this simplifies the process. So you have the original play text, it has specific size, and you do have a key, master key. Then split the plain text into two halves, left and right is the original one. Then after that, for each round, it depends how many rounds, you're going to repeat the same operation. You take the right-hand side, you're going to be fed to the left-hand side for the next uh, value or next flag, right? Then after that, you're going to do what here? Um, take what? The, whatever you have on the right side with the key. The sub key before this operation. We didn't talk about whatever find this operation, but must be invertible. That's the meaning here. Then after that, X all with the left side. Then after that, produce the RI. Okay. Let me come with the symbol. I go to here. You see, I oh, see. Uh, go over this one quick to just to make sure that uh, to understand why it's the case, why it works. And try to have, uh, yeah. Oh, you got it. I did have the permission to uh, use the white flag, right? Okay. So the algorithm here we have here. So L1 is equal to what? R0. Remember, we said Li equal Ri minus 1, right? Then after that, we said here the Ri is equal to what? To Li minus 1 x or with function with Ri minus one and the Ki, right? So in this case, the L1 has this value and the R1 is equal to what? It's gonna be L0, F with R0 and K1, all right? So here, assume this is the encryption. Assume we have only one iteration, just to simulate one iteration to see how it works. So here we start, for example, with L0, R0. We end up, we have L1 and R1, right? I need to reverse the operation, go back. When you perform the decryption, you're gonna start the reverse the operation until reach the original message. So assume that we have L1 and R1. I wanted to see whether I managed to retrieve L0, R0 or not. So I have this data. How can you get L0? Oh, let's say start with the simple one. I need to find L0 and then find the R0. It looks like the R0 is easy to get, right? R0 is going to equal whatever you have in L1, right? I got value of R0. Make sense? When you try to reverse the operation. Remember, this is the way how to perform encryption. When you try to reverse the operation, when, when you perform encryption, we need to keep in our mind the way of uh, I mean, like... Uh, we need to make sure that we're still being able to reverse the operation. Yeah, we start L0, R1, 0, so you produce L1 and R1. If you have L1 and R1, you're going to be able to reproduce L0, R0. That's the decryption, right? When you start to encrypt the data, you need to find a way, or find a, uh, somehow, a way in order to reverse the operation, right? So L0 is so L1, okay? Then R1, I'm oh, sorry, L0, is equal to what here? I have. I need to compute the value here. I do have R0. Yes, I got this one. Do you have the key one? Yes, I do have this one. Do you have the value R1? Yes, I do have the value R1 because it's given here. So in this case, L0 is going to be R1 XO with what? F with R0 and K1. So you manage to retrieve the value. So that's the way that it's not random just to exchange your bastard one to the left or the right. No. There is a reason behind this one. It's allow us in order to manage to retrieve, I mean, the original message. Make sense? Is this clear, guys? Okay. Let me jump to the right slide here. So. So that's what we did here. At the end, we're gonna what? We're gonna have, I mean, we need to, in order to, you say, exchange the value of R, the left with the right. 
Okay, why? This one is going to allow me in order to reverse the operation. Otherwise, we cannot reverse the operation. One thing here, you see that for if at the end of each iteration, you need to reverse in order to what? In order to start the next operation. The last one here, since we're going to exchange the value of R0 and L0, in, well, in, uh, I mean the left and the right, uh, and we're going to reverse this one in the final answer. Let me say something here. That what in the final round, that's what I'm looking for. This is the result. This is the final result that I'm looking for. Whatever I have the value here, whatever I have in the value here. But uh, for the symmetry reason, that's reason in this case, I wanted to use the same actual algorithm that implemented in order to perform the same round, one round, two and round n. So in this case, since every single algorithm requires me at the end, we need to swap the value left with the right, then after that it can be input to the next round. For the last round, I swapped here, but there is no round, none. So in this case, there is, I need to return it back, it will swap it back. Okay? Does that make any sense? For the symmetries, I need to have to use the same or simply to simplify the process, I need to use the exact implementation. So now maybe you have a piece of software or hardware which simulate what you're going to have required from you to say, give me the key for this round. Give me the input of the, let's say, Li and Ri. I'm going to produce the value Li and uh, Li plus 1 and Ri plus 1. This is the piece of hardware. I'm going to use the same hardware. Yeah, it depends on the algorithm. Here in our case, we said it might be yeah, we, uh, in this one, uh, we're going to, so, so, when you talk about the DS, the DS is going to have the same structure. Yeah, in the CD slab, you're going to perform like the commands, just perform encryption decryptions. Okay? Of course, you're not going to go deeper inside this one. You're not going to write the code in order to perform the operation. But you need to, for you to understand how it works. Yeah? You want to say you want to perform encryption. You're not going to go deeper, you say how many rounds you need to perform. The only thing you're going to say, this is the plain text, this is the key, this is the algorithm, go ahead. The system is going to write this one. So again, assume that we have a piece of hardware which simulates each round here. Put input and the output. So I'm going to use the piece of hardware here and here and here. Once I use this one here, I don't need the final swabbing actually at the end because this is the final answer must be here. So in this case, I need to perform the final swapping here. If you don't do this one, this means you are not going to be able to achieve the master. And since we're going to use the exact piece of hardware software here for every single round for simplicity, so we're going to keep this one, uh, exchange the left and the right, then after that, put it back. Okay. How many rounds do you have? It depends on the algorithm. Remember, this is just, I mean, the building block. This is just, I mean, the design model, which is allow you in order to use whatever algorithm. How can you perform the decryption? In order to perform the decryption, we're going to start from here and go up. So in this case, we're going to use the same algorithm here. The only difference here, you're going to use what? You're going to use the keys in the reverse order. Remember we talked about the composite encryption? We said encrypt with the K1, then after that encrypt with the K2, right? When you try to reverse the operation, you have the first thing, when you decrypt to perform the reverse operation, you have to start with the last key with the K2. Then after that, it's going to be K1. So the order of the keys is going to be in reverse order. And we're going to use the exact algorithm. So nothing is going to be changed except the key order. And also, of course, the input is not going to be the plain text. It's going to be the cyber text. Okay? That's all, guys, for today. And as I mentioned, hopefully, the plan to go back to the class in person on Wednesday, I cannot guarantee that. Hopefully, there is no big snow. Hopefully you're gonna be fine. So so far, so good. So far we're gonna see you on the Monday, uh Wednesday. Okay. Thanks guys, that's all. And enjoy the rest of the day.